I'll take that as a yes. Thank yes, you. That's a thank you. Well, hello everyone, I'm Carol Adams. Welcome to this first webinar hosted by the Sustainability Accounting Management and Policy Journal, SAMJ, together with the Social and Environmental Sustainability and Organizations Research Group at Swinburne University and the Ethical Finance Accountability and Governance Research Center at Durham University Business School. SAMJ authors tackle sustainable development issues with a view to challenging and finding solutions for practice and policy issues. And our participants today include academics, consultants, investors, corporates, and standard setters. And you can submit questions via the Q&A. We're using the term sustainable development risks to mean risks that arise from sustainable development megatrends, such as climate change, poverty, inequality, and food security. Identifying and mitigating sustainable development risks and seeking opportunities to address them is critical for all of us and to future generations. But there are a number of tensions in the debates and policy initiatives as to how to go about it, and in particular, the role of corporate reporting. Here are five of those uh, tensions. So firstly, there's a focus um, on climate change related risk reporting, with some making that their primary or only focus. Others have emphasized that making risk reporting mandatory mustn't stop with climate change, and climate change is interdependent with the achievement of most, if not all, of the other sustainable development goals. So if we try to address climate change in isolation, we might exacerbate other sustainable development issues. But also we need to think beyond climate change when developing a conceptual framework for sustainability reporting, otherwise we'll possibly end up with, with one that's not fit for broader issues. Secondly, there's a push to consider sustainable development risks from an investor perspective. There's an assumption that investors around the world have the same view. Assumptions have been made about what this is, but I've heard investors um, express a range of different views. And also there's a question mark about whether some investors know what information is going to lead to the best performance. And thirdly, there's a push to focus risk disclosures and sustainability disclosures more broadly on the information needs of investors and creditors. Apart from that being a bit tricky, if we're unclear what the investor perspective is, it seems to me to be misaligned with the audience for corporate reports. Reporters tell me that their key audiences include current and prospective um, employees, customers, regulatory body, bodies, civil society organizations, and so on. Fourthly, much of the focus is on risks. And yes, it is critical that we address them, but companies and investors also need to identify opportunities that are created by um, sustainable development issues uh, and to address those issues um, through their strategies, products and services and you know, take advantage of them. Fifthly, there's a focus on measuring and specifically measuring sustainable development impacts on the organization and cash flows. Research over decades has observed how accounting makes things visible and other, and other things invisible. So there's a risk that by focusing on the financial, we ignore the real issues that will impact on all of us, including the prosperity of business and their investors in the long term. So our panel members are well placed to tell us how they use information on sustainable development risks, where the gaps are, and so on. Um, Christian Fock is CIO of one of Australia's largest superannuation funds, CBUS. A timeline we developed in their 2017 annual report showed just how much had been done in a few years. But of course, um, I'm sure he'd agree there's still some way to go. Damien Walsh is CEO of Bank Australia and previously CFO. Bank Australia's website says it's the bank for people who believe in a fair and just world, working with customers to use their money to benefit communities and our planet. Russell Pico is special advisor to the TCFD, a member of the trustee board of the UK's largest pension fund, the USS. 
and Chair of the Trustee Board of HSBC um, UK Pension Fund. He's also an honorary professor at Durham University Business School and he's former Chief Accountant at HSBC. Professor Richard Slack, a professor of accounting at Durham University and editorial board member of Sanjay will take the lead in identifying some future research topics that emerge from uh, the discussion. But before we get on to the discussion, I want to introduce Dr. Subhash Abhaya Wansa, an associate professor at Swinburne University and associate editor of Sanjay. Subhash is going to give us a brief summary um, of the themes covered in research on this topic to date. So over to you, Subhash. Uh, thank you very much, Carol. In my brief presentation, I intend to provide an overview of the sustainable development risk reporting landscape. Uh, my presentation is based on research evidence from both academic sources and studies conducted by accounting firms, professional accounting bodies, and consulting firms. The risk landscape has shifted for many years from traditional financial risks to more environmental and social risks. As we know, the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated these risks and laid bare the interconnectedness of them and financial risks. To add to this, the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is IPCC, issued early this month, highlights that many risks from rapid climate change are now imminent. Climate change is an existential risk. Therefore, the most significant sustainable development risk, according to my view. Like the pandemic and climate change, other sustainable development risks, which most see as beyond the horizon for now, can nevertheless strike us unexpectedly and become existential threats. One such risk is biodi biodiversity collapse. The implication of these uh, realizations is that Organizations should rethink the nature and proximity of risks they ought to manage and look at known risks in new ways and holistically. Best practice risk management requires staying ahead of risks, as we all know. The accountability and transparency of corporate disclosure on sustainable development risk, risks is highly critical for organizational survival, for meeting stakeholder needs, as well as the United Nations 2030 Agenda. The research shows that there has already been a shift in investment to favor companies that are addressing sustainable development risks. Companies with high ESG ratings have earned comparatively high stock returns and experienced low volatility. Fund flows to ESG-focused funds have increased exponentially as well. The clarity with which organizations communicate how they manage sustainable development risks also indicates how clearly those responsible for oversight, that is the board and senior executives, see those risks and their implications when they exercise their duty of care to companies. A recent study conducted by researchers from RMIT University here in Melbourne in collaboration with CPA Australia provide some interesting insights into the current state of reporting on the SDGs or the Sustainable Development Goals by the top 150 companies listed on the Australian Securities Exchange or the ASX. According to this research, which was released just last month, the number of Australian companies reporting on the SDGs is growing. This report shows that 63% of the top 150 companies mentioned the SDGs in their 2020 annual or sustainability reports. This report also explains that climate change and gender equality are among the top three SDG priorities for companies. However, it is doubtful that companies are genuinely concerned about sustainable development risks and opportunities. I'll explain why I say that. On the one hand, there are many reports of greenwashing or rainbow washing by companies. For those who haven't heard of it, rainbow washing is a term for companies using the colorful SDG logos in corporate reports without really taking meaningful action on them. On the other hand, the tone from the top is not always consistent with what's reported. 
For instance, the RMIT report shows that only in 11 companies, the messages from the chairperson or the CEO published in the annual report refer to the SDGs. This finding is consistent with the 2018 KPMG study as well. Moreover, a 2019 report from uh, the United Nations Global Compact and Accenture Strategy shows that CEOs of many companies that take action on the SDGs do not appreciate how such action leads to value creation for, for shareholders, let alone stakeholders. Another indication of how serious companies are about sustainable, sustainable development risks is the action they take in relation to climate change. According to a report published by ACCA last month, 71% of survey respondents in Canada and, U and, and the US reported their organization has not pledged to be net zero by 2040. The lack of plans to achieve net zero emissions is startling, I think, when investors and asset managers are calling for it and governments are introducing regulation towards it. Research shows that reporting on risks such as climate related risks have improved and more and more companies are disclosing that they're adopting the TCFD framework. However, several research reports show that the quality of their reporting is poor. These studies imply that climate risk reporting is box ticking. For, for example, the annual review conducted by the TCFD in 2020 shows that disclosure of the potential financial impacts of climate change on the company's businesses and strategies is low. According to the EY Global Climate Risk Disclosure Barometer published this year, the average disclosure quality for organizations adopting the TCFD recommendations was about half the maximum quality score. A study I published with Professor Carol Adams early this year shows a low level of awareness of business risks from climate change among a sample of the world's largest companies most susceptible to climate risks. It might be surprising for you to hear what we found. We found that four of the world's largest airline companies did not explain how climate risks affected them. Among those that did disclose risks, the focus was the increased risk of regulation and pressure from stakeholders to reduce emissions. The other transition risks, such as customers switching to green alternatives or physical risks of climate change, which have more long-term consequences, were not explained by most companies in our study. Previous research, as well as the TCFD recommendations, identify four areas of disclosure in relation to risks. These are applicable to reporting on sustainable development risks as well. The first relates to board's governance around sustainable development risks. It includes explaining the level of oversight on how sustainable development risks are integrated within strategy, management approach, and performance and targets. We can see some promising trends in the reporting on this governance aspect. The RMIT report I mentioned previously shows that 111 of the ASX 150 companies have a separate committee with oversight on sustainability matters. Also, this report explains that the number of companies having board members with sustainability experience has increased by about four folds in the three years to 2020. This is, this is interesting given the recent debate about competency washing. The second area of disclosure is about how organizational strategy changes to respond to the identified sustainable development risks and opportunities. And the third area of risk disclosure is the management's approach in relation to risks, uh, risk management. It is about integrating sustainable development risks into all aspects of the organization and decision-making. The study I conducted with uh, Carol on climate and pandemic reporting by top airline hotels and cruise companies shed some light on the level of reporting on strategy and management approach. 
The companies we examined were those that were most at risk from pandemics and climate change. Yet, only four companies explain strategies for mitigating pandemic-related risks, and a similar number of companies explain strategies for addressing physical risks of climate change. Our study found that more than half the companies didn't disclose their materiality metrics as well. Now, the materiality metrics helps companies to assess external risks and opportunities relevant to them. So not disclosing a materiality matrix is a significant cause of concern from a sustainable risk management perspective. Without a materiality matrix, it is not clear whether business strategies informed by an assessment of sustainable development risks and how risks affect management decisions. Another indication of the problem of lack of integration of climate risk in business strategy is whether companies conduct climate scenario analysis. The scenario analysis is a useful tool to inform risk assessment, strategy development, and management decision making. The EY Global Climate Risk Disclosure Barometer, which I mentioned earlier, shows that only 41% of organizations in the sample are conducting climate scenario analysis. Final or fourth aspect of risk reporting relates to performance and targets in relation to managing sustainable development risks. The state of reporting on this aspect is particularly poor according to Bingler, Krauss and Lippold. Their paper is currently available on SSRN if you are interested. To add to that, some argue that organizations are reporting on metrics and targets that do not correlate directly to risks. I will now summarize what I said so far about current state of sustainable development risk reporting. Firstly, current research relating to reporting on sustainable development risks mainly focuses on climate risks and reporting on the SDGs. Secondly, many companies are still poor at reporting sustainable development risks especially relating to strategy, management approach, and targets and metrics. Thirdly, in many instances, risk disclosures amount to cheap talk or greenwashing. Finally, companies are repackaging information to, uh, so they have, I mean, the information they have previously disclosed to show commitment to the SDGs or alignment with the TCFT recommendations. So that's me at the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Subash. Um, that was that was uh, very interesting. Um, looking at all the different research that's been done. Now, Russell, if I could turn to you um, first of all. Um, you signed off on a, a letter as the chair of the trustee board of HSBC to the um, UK Environment Agency asking about um, using the TCFD recommendations and so on. But I'm wondering, turning that the other way around, as, as investors, what do um, pension funds need to know about sustainable development risks? Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, so I, this, this is a very important well, topic, but I, mean, I think there is... Um, Russell, you did say his... his you, we lost you for a moment there, Russell. Can you hear me now, Carol? Yes, we Good. can. Good, okay. So um, like all these issues, I think there is a range of understanding and a range of views. I think it is, it is clear that right now, climate change risk is the most prominent of the sustainable development risks and opportunities that are on the minds of, of uh, certainly the, the, the UK pension schemes and other investors I talk to. And I think that's very understandable. Um, there is a very considerable amount of political momentum around climate change. Uh, we've had the recent uh, IPCC report and uh, the, the, the calls for even, even more urgent action. Um, and of course, we have TCFD that's now been out for, for several years and in a number of countries, including the UK, TCFD reporting is being made mandatory for public companies and indeed for, for large pension schemes. I, th I think there is um, some encouraging signs, I wouldn't overstate it, some encouraging signs of awareness of these other existential risks that flow from sustainability. No doubt the pandemic has certainly raised 
questions in investors' minds around the social aspects of, 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 what, of what they're doing. Um, I think it's also a sense of the, the time horizon that we think about. So, for example, on one of the boards I'm on, the defined benefit scheme is, is closed and my time horizon is relatively short. It's probably 10 years or so with substantially de-risk. But for my open defined contribution scheme, many of my younger members will be investing for 30 or 40 years. And over those longer term uh, investment horizons, I think investors do need to think about sustainable risks and opportunities. The, the, the problem is that outside climate change, I think the understanding of how to tackle those risks and what opportunities they present, um, and also how do you measure uh, those, those risks is very much in its in its infancy. I mean, we have the the fledgling TNFD, the sort of the the, the comparable um, international task force looking at nature related financial disclosures, but they're in the early stages of their work. Um, so, so I think climate change definitely most prominent, utmost in investors' minds. Also, a sense of if you tackle climate change, you probably also to some extent tackle some of these other issues but yeah, quite a long way to go carol yeah subash talked about um uh, the disclosure of strategy and uh governance oversight and, and governance competencies how important is that from an investor perspective um you know, are you are you seeking to gain some idea of the competence of management um, and the governing and the governing um, body, or are you just um, are, are you just looking for metrics? I, I, I don't think we're just looking for metrics. Um, as you know, Carol, I I very much like the, the structure of the TCFT report. That's what we incorporated mm -hmm. in the STGD recommendations paper that, that we co-authored. And, and for me, the right yeah. starting place is to understand who takes responsibility for understanding these risks and opportunities, the relationship between the board and executive management. And then fundamentally, have they thought through the impact on their business strategy and their business model? That to me is the most important question. If, if we're going to um, be a long-term investor in a company or indeed buy their debt, we need to understand uh, what the long-term cash flow prospects look like, getting a handle on where they may be today through standardized, uniform, good quality metrics is helpful, but well, that's only a point in time. Much more important is the longer term forward looking information. And the starting point for that is them properly discussing that uh, in their strategy and policy, and hopefully at some point, then moving to set targets, and then the metrics then align with the reporting against those targets. Great, right, thank you. So uh, sort of a broad range of um, narrative reporting uh, along with the metrics to give an idea of the, the competence of management and, and the governance oversight. And, and all put um, through an appropriately strong financial reporting discipline. Yeah, what does that actually mean? Um, uh, so so um, and one of the pieces of thinking behind TCFD is that if you ask a company to disclose information, thing, things happen. Typically, mm. the audit committee gets involved and typically one of the main board directors, the finance director gets involved. And that means that there is much stronger governance. There's also much more discipline. So um, I think there is, there is a risk right now with the SDG information which is being published if it is not being put through the traditional disciplines. And it's at its most straightforward that means an investor needs to have confidence that the numbers add up and that the okay. reporting universe being used by that company is the same for the consolidation. And, and that, isn't, that is by no means a given if the finance function has gone nowhere near those numbers. Yeah, so you're talking about the rigour and the quality and the internal controls and not, 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 about, um, not about putting numbers in financial terms necessarily then? No. No. It's about the processes. OK, um, uh, Christian, what information do you seek on sustainable development risks impacting on um, your investments and where do you get it from? Given, yeah. given uh, as Subai <laughs> said, that reporting is so cool. <laughs> 
I, th I think there's a couple of things, and it also depends on uh, what what markets you're investing in. So, I think it's very different if you're looking at listed markets, where you're pulling together a broader portfolio, and also you can uh, influence by your you know your engagement and voting, compared to say when you're investing in a private market asset where you can demand much deeper uh, information. So, yeah. in relation to, uh, for instance, in listed markets. Um, yes, um, certainly there's there's a, a global investor push for TCFD reporting frameworks. Um, that's that's really important, at least to get a sense of, you know, what are the scenarios that the company is sort of thinking about that sort of beyond the, you know, the one year reporting uh, period. Uh, but it, it needs to be also um, followed up with, you know, receiving that information and then engaging in, okay, what are you going to do about it? And so... Um, particularly for for those companies that are the um, probably the you know the largest greenhouse uh, gas emitters or polluters, um, you know there's 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 a global uh, initiative called Climate Action 100 Plus, uh, where where the investors will take that information and say okay well now you've got that here, and start to put a bit more rigor around it. So one of the things about TCFDs is that companies can select the scenarios. <clears throat> so. But once the investors see that, then they can go, well, have a look at the IPCC, the IPCC reports and, 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 and then you start to put, you know, a greater sense of rigour around it. So I think that combination is quite effective. There's some interesting things you can do with big data in portfolios. So, um, uh, you know, we, we've, we've worked with um, a Dutch uh, fund that actually uses AI to scrape information and looks at um, the SDG exposure. Um, so that's okay to do in a big portfolio, but it's hard to sort of, because it is sort of, you know, uh, based on sort of on average, getting a sense of it, um, you, you would then have to take that information and go directly to the company itself. So uh, for those, those investors that are stock pickers, um, you can do that. You can say, okay, I've got this high level research. Tell me a bit more. And it's quite interesting is that with, um, um, there are some constraints around continuous uh, disclosure, but often with some of these things, you can actually get, um, you know, a better feel for whether there's a, a greater connectivity between what the company thinks, uh, you know, their consumers want, which directly impacts uh, revenues and profitability uh, compared to what maybe they're reporting or what, or what they're actually doing. And so we, we use some of those tools. With private markets, um, if you're an owner, you can go right into the more granular um, uh, information. But even then, collecting information can be quite challenging. So, for instance, with with our property portfolio, um, there's a there's a, a global framework that we um, sort of submit information, um, which is uh, called Gresby. Uh, looks at sort of a number of different, you know, quite granular operational metrics around the properties that we own. Uh, around sustainability and actually we get you know our properties get ranked against uh, others globally and the exercise of collecting that information is really useful for two things first of all <clears throat> to demonstrate um, you know the, the the characteristics and the risks of those portfolios you tend to find the more sustainable properties are the ones that are more in demand for from renters and so there's actually a, a risk and a financial connection there but the exercise of actually working out sort of where the energy use is, um, you know, how can we recycle um, building materials you know, when we do the sort of the, the construction uh, phase in a more efficient way, um, also creates learnings for how do you do things better. Uh, so, so information is important, but I think, um, you know, the lack of, you know, not there not being information should not be a barrier to front into I think the opportunity. Okay um, and what about um, opportunities I mean how would you assess whether an organization was taking advantage of opportunities or is that just too far away into the future beyond the capabilities that you have at the moment to um, to think about? Well, certainly, I mean, from our point of view, um, there's 17 sustainable development goals. There's been a bit of work around how, because they weren't, they weren't originally de uh, developed to be investable. 
So um, um, you know, several investors have sort of said there's probably about 13 that's investable. In our case, because even that's still quite a lot, uh, we, we picked a subset of them, six, which align a lot more with some of our expertise. So they sort of cover things like the, the built environment, sustainable sort of energy, uh, gender and so forth. And, and therefore we, we can start to um, uh, measure activities around that. And so, for instance, we measure the amount of work that's created through the investments that we make, make on the unlisted side around property. Uh, and we get that, um, again, going back to the, you know, is it rainbow washing or not? You know, we get these things assured uh, independently to make sure that the data is, is, is able to be verified. Uh, we've done some work around um, affordable housing. That's hard to do when you're objective is to try and maximise risk adjusted returns, but um, we were able to work with government agencies around finding a place for, for, for debt there. And we, and we can also translate that to, you know, how many places does that actually uh, provide? Um, so that's probably a relevant metric uh, of success uh, there. Um, so, so those are the, the sort of things um, that we can do. This, this other thing I talked about, which is using AI to get sort of broad exposures on the portfolio, I think it's a useful thing, but it's probably more around mapping rather than impact. Um, but I think also, you know, it's a useful thing. So, for instance, looking at, uh, our, you know, the carbon intensity exposure of our whole portfolio, I think that's useful information. Uh, and, you know, we have made commitments along with others to, to, to align our portfolio with uh, net zero and also with interim targets. Uh, and we can do some things around working with companies, seeing how they're transforming their business and aligning with that trajectory. Uh, but we've also got a, you know, allocations where we want to invest in the opportunity. So you talk about the risks that, you know, for us, it's, um, it, you know, for, for every risk, there has to be some return or some opportunity. And uh, so, you know, a transition away from a high uh, carbon intensity uh, economy uh, means that there are opportunities to invest in that transition. And so we've got, um, you know, embedded investments uh, in, in, in you know, for our property portfolio, but we've also got a carve out of our portfolio to invest in a range of those sort of opportunities, whether it's technology and so forth. Part of that's, that's about making a difference, but more for us, it's also learning a lot more around where those uh, trends are to see whether we can direct more capital um, yeah, into those areas. And you work with um, AXI um, that yeah. does do, um, it does examine sustainability uh, reports of organisations and it shows up the ones who aren't doing very well. Um, could you tell us a bit about that and how you use that information and that relationship with um, AXI? If I, um, if I remember correctly, that's the Australian Council of Superannuation so, investors. Yeah. Superannuation investors. Yes. Yeah. So, so Axi is um, so it's, it's focused more on the listed market space, mm. uh, and so that that starts to um, uh, interface with our engagement strategies, uh, but also the way we think about voting. So, um, um, you know, if if there are um, either shareholder proposals that are put up or um, you know, we look at whether there is proper alignment around REM and, and strategy and so forth. So, so that, that's, that's, that's sort of part of it. It helps give us a framework um, where as uh, individual investors, we can sort of approach the company with a, a common theme. It also gives us common information to work off as well. And so that's, that's really important. And then you can extend that to the Climate Action 100 plus program uh, globally and and that's been quite helpful particularly where we've got Australian companies that are dual listed for instance that that have um, uh, both uh, shareholders that are overseas and in Australia. Okay um, thank you. Now um, Damien um, I see from your 2020 impact report that you take a triple bottle line approach um, or people planet and prosperity approach to your own business model but what information does Bank Australia seek about Australian development? As sorry about sustainable sustainable development issues through through lending. Yeah, so certainly um, 
through our portfolio, we've been trying to uh, build out uh, a, a greater diversity of exposure in terms of risk exposure. So we're predominantly in uh, mortgage secured housing, but encouraging customers to purchase more sustainably, you know, higher sustainably designed houses, more energy efficient. So we see them as less risky assets over the longer term. Um, touching on some areas that where Christian um, has invested in as well. So been lending through to affordable housing, cooperative housing, social housing, uh, and uh, specialist disability accommodation. So I think where you're trying to address broader sustainability issues through your lending and investment activities, uh, not just addressing climate change, but social justice, um, fairness and equity uh, in our society becomes important, I think, in terms of the opportunities that you spoke of in terms of growing your business. But then uh, the challenge is around how do you measure that and record that and report that. And very much I agree with Russell's earlier comment about using the disciplines within your business, so that might be your finance team and, and other um, subject matter experts within your organisation to help bring that holistic view of the business through to your sustainability reporting. Um, and Subash, you made me a little bit depressed with your, your research. So um, let's hope that there's, there's opportunity to improve, but I definitely agree with your um, idea about being open and transparent, but also about the matrix that you're using to measure um, where you can um, you know, have impact and what's, what's material for your business and, and then how you might address um, social and environmental governance uh, issues where you can have that sort of material impact uh, as an organisation. So can you give us an example, um, Damien, if you, if you were to lend money to, um, say, a large farm, um, what kind of things would you look at before making that, um, mm. that loan? Yeah, so certainly. So if we were lending into the agribusiness sector, um, we would go beyond the traditional lending lens that you would apply around capacity to, to you know, service the debt, the underlying assets, um, the security that you would take for that, for that typical loan. But we would step into what are that animal husbandry practices um, that are uh, utilised in, um, in that particular business and think about um, where they um, fit with our uh, ethics as an organisation. So, for example... We have published a responsible banking policy, very similar to um, the sort of responsible investment policies that you see in the pension funds. But as a bank, we've been very clear and transparent about areas where we will invest in and where we won't. So there are areas in um, uh, to do with agribusiness that we would choose not to invest in. So, for example, if that if that farm that you were speaking of was involved in the live export trade, then we would use that as a, a negative um, measure to, to actually exclude any lending into that particular activity. Hmm. And how do you find this information, Damien? Um, I mean, do you look at annual reports? Is the information there? Haha, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, no I, mean, I think Christian's, you know, spoke to that. So when you're dealing with the individuals, you've got the opportunity to ask questions and, yeah. and delve down. And, and, and mm. as a small bank, we have limited capacity within our organisation. So we may then go to external organisations where they are actually subject matter experts in, um, you know, climate risk or um, whatever it might be that, that the issue that you're dealing with and leverage that expertise to help inform our lending and investment decisions. Mm, okay. Um, so I'm really getting the feel from all of this that corporate reports aren't really what are used. They're, they're not much use um, currently. Um, Russell, what, what do you think needs to happen for them to become more useful? Or is there any point in them becoming more useful to aid investors and uh, lenders of money um, to um, corporations? Well, I think there is a lot of point in making annual reports uh, more useful. I, I still have a somewhat traditional view that they are a very important medium of communication from a company to um, a, broad, a broad range of, of, of stakeholders. 
Um, and I think what needs to happen is that there needs to be put in place a framework to, to govern and ultimately mandate reporting across a whole, a whole suite of issues. Because, because at the moment, for example, in the position of being an investor, if I choose to invest through a third party fund, and the third party fund manager is making claims about um, the mapping of that portfolio to the SDGs, which increasingly is happening. And, and if I have a conviction that I wish to um, thematically choose some of the SDGs to uh, guide my investment policy, then I'm pretty much left to trusting the fund manager to make those decisions. And as we've heard, um, uh, there may be quite flimsy evidence for their mapping of that portfolio to, to the SDGs. Probably climate change risk is, is, as we said earlier, the most, the most developed. So that needs to be dealt with. And I think it needs to be dealt with really, really quite urgently to, to fill that gap. Okay, thank you. Now, if we were to you know, develop a form of mandatory reporting that was looking at things from the perspective of the impact on um, the organisation and, and cash flows, um, can we trust companies to be able to work out what those things are? Or should we be asking them to report um, what are the material sustainable development issues and um, uh, and information on their process of managing that and the governance oversight so that others can have that information and make those judgments themselves? Yeah, I think this is quite a, quite a difficult question um, because I think, I think materiality uh, tends to sit a little differently depending on the national jurisdiction in which you sit, is, is, is my sense. So there are certain jurisdictions where this is uh, firmly governed by the by the legal profession, for example, there'll be other jurisdictions where um, perhaps the finance community has a, a stronger say over, over what gets disclosed. Because if if you are in a in a situation where management is making materiality calls and effectively not really saying how they're making those calls, depending on where you are, there can be some sort of lingering suspicion that they've actually used a very high bar to determine what's material and that you as an investor may take a rather different view. And, and one, of the, one of the challenging aspects of this is, as, as we all know, an issue which may seem not very important today, but that there may be of interest to particular parts of civil society, for example, can actually be quite an important investor issue tomorrow. And uh, I think that's one of the challenges here is, is the sort of migration of sustainable development risks and opportunities from um, being a civil society question to being a broader investor question. How do you manage that transition and how do you set a framework for reporting that embraces yes. that satisfactorily? And how can we know what ones will translate into an investor issue as, the, as they appear? Oh. How indeed. Yeah. Um, we have one question from the audience, and then I might ask panel members if they have any questions for each other. Um, uh, so we have one from John Finistor, who says it's been suggested that material uh, disclosure data is being shared privately among companies as part of M&E investments. And if this, if this has been actively considered, has this been actively considered by standard developers in their work? Um, we might not know the answer to that. We might have some ideas on how it might be done. Does anybody want to take that? Shall I have a, a first stab, Carol? Go for it, Russell, please. Uh, I mean, I think, I think if you're in a situation as a, as a private investor, then you will obviously carry out appropriate due, due diligence. Um, and the question is, to what extent is that information already in the public domain or will that be shared with, 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 with you privately? Um, I think one of the challenges that you face as an as a investor making a direct investment is that um, you, you, people shouldn't, shouldn't believe necessarily that the, uh, the acquiring company is going to find out all the information that they, that, that they, um, that they would like. Because if, if you think about some of the sustainable development issues, 
if if the company hasn't considered them, then there's going to be very little information, frankly, yeah. and they're not going to be able to create that information on the sort of timescales that that um, uh, that you would need to make those those decisions. So I wouldn't overstate this issue, perhaps. I might just sort of add, um, particularly in the private market space, you know, the vendor is going to give you, you know, accurate historical information and their models and projections. Um, but clearly, you know, that's a forecast. Um, when, when you sort of seek to either acquire or own, uh, you know, part of it is that you want to be able to drive the strategy going forward and you'll have to seek your own views and often you'll bring in your own experts to either challenge the sensibility uh, of those assumptions, usually they're, they're usually overly uh, generous. So, um, uh, and, and I think that's probably also the same with, you know, with companies, you can sort of get a sense of what they've done historically. Uh, you got a sense of sort of where, you know, maybe management are thinking are priority areas of consideration. Uh, but ultimately, you have to make an assessment as to whether, you know, the quality of management and what they're doing um, is fit for purpose for the environment. So you've got to bring your own information uh, into that equation. Thank you. Uh, now, Richard, did you have, did you want to ask any um, questions of anybody? Uh, yes, well, as Christian has just been speaking, I'll, um, I'll, I'll ask a question of, of Christian. Um, just reflecting on one of the areas you talked about earlier, Christian, we mentioned um, AXI. Um, and I suppose my concern with um, agencies that, let's say, produce um, checklists or scoring of um, any type of risk, but principally SDG risk, may focus on all of the risks and develop a little tick box and say, oh, this company's only done 12 out of the 17 and therefore they're not that good. But one of the things that is important and, and you recognized was that it depends upon what the investor is looking for. And if those 12 risks are really central to your needs, well, actually they're very good, um, not just satisfactory or, or poor. So how do you how do you reconcile in a way the, um, that against the power of the use of checklists that seem to uh, be be evident? So there's a couple there's a couple of things. First of all, we don't rely on one service provider only, uh, so that's that's really important. Um, but cl clearly, um, um, even though we're a largish pension fund, we still don't own a very large part of. The shares. So having some common language where at least, you know, broadly, you know, the um, enough of the shareholders are actually speaking with a common view that will force the company to, you know, to say, actually, this is important. These are issues that we need to respond to is really important. Um, so so, it, so it, it's it's a combination of those two things. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's broad alignment that, that we need as investors, more information around how companies are assessing and responding to climate change risk and so forth. And there's broad agreement that the TCFD framework is a good one to start with. So that, that, that's, that, that's how you can sort of initiate that change. Then when you get that information, that starts to evaluate your discussions with management around how does that actually compare with what you're sort of forecasting the opportunities to be, uh, where's your relative position in terms of, you know, your cost of extracting a, you know, particular, say it's, say it's a transitioning um, uh, energy asset. So what's your relative cost? So how, how are you going to, you know, com um, compare in terms of its lifetime compared to what you got compared to the market? So it gives us something um, tangible that we can then make the sort of decisions uh, against. But often those conversations then start to really challenge management themselves around where's, where's the best aspect for, you know, the future prospects for the business. And, you know, you, you know a, a recent example, so BHP, for instance. So, so I, I think, um, you know, um, they're, they're sort of like a stick and a carrot sort of approach that we can do. The stick is that we can vote directors in and out. We can vote down in Australia um, uh, REM, REM reports that can spill. 
Uh, but the carrot is that there's actually richer information that if we agree with the direction of uh, where where the business is going, we're going to actually put money into more money into it. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. So, so if I just go back to those tensions that I mentioned at, at the beginning, um, so so what I'm getting from this is that climate um, change is obviously really important. And uh, we have the TCFD, so we can get um, more of that information. Um, part of the reason we're not perhaps looking at other issues is that we don't have the information yet uh, from, from companies. And on the second point I made about the investor perspective, in, in fact, um, just one investor might have a number of different perspectives. So it's not just different investors having different perspectives. It, it, depends, um, it depends what we're talking about and what, um, what you're investing in. Um, I think you can correct me if, I'm, if, I'm, if I've got that wrong. Um, on the need to focus on um, the information needs of investors and creditors, I think we are, um, you know, we have drawn out of this conversation that if that's our starting point, we might miss things because um, we don't know what might at some point uh, become relevant to um, investors that's already relevant to um, other, other stakeholders. Um, on, the, on, the, you know, on the focus on uh, opportunities as well, I, th I think we've, we've talked about the need for disclosure of strategy so that we can see how well management are developing their, their strategy to take account of opportunities. Um, but we didn't really get um, more detail into that. And on measuring, um, you know, we need to be able to measure in all sorts of different ways, not just in, in financial in, in financial ways, um, so that we're not missing those, those major um, impacts. And, and the TCFD recommendations don't just talk about uh, measurement in financial terms in any case. Did I miss anything, Miss? Um, uh, was there anything anybody wanted to add to that before oh, I turn some... to Richard? Oh, Damien? sorry, Damien. Here, Carol. So I, I just was, um, as I was listening to that, reflecting on, I think, you know, the, the, the investor appetite around sustainable development is, is getting stronger, um, certainly from our perspective, getting away um, uh, sustainable development bonds into the market is much easier today than it was some years ago. So, um, you know, using the SDGs as a, a framework to measure the impact um, that those investments are making, having that assured, going and talking to the investor market. Today, they understand the language uh, around what a sustainable development bond looks like, whereas perhaps, you know, five or 10 years ago, it might have just been a green bond or a social bond. But there's certainly a broader perspective now, I think, developing around what's this, what a sustainable development investment actually looks like. I might just um, add on top of that that there, there's an increasing um, uh, amount of work that um, different parts of finance or finance providers are doing to look at uh, a common taxonomy around mm -hmm. actually yeah. trying to identify what truly is contributing towards you know different um, uh, sustainability uh, factors. So um, you know, um, in Europe. There's, there's probably some more established taxonomies, even to the extent where, um, you know, they're starting to look at, uh, the regulators starting to look at mandating the use of those taxonomies to be able to measure whether portfolios, you know, which parts of the portfolios are actually contributing to um, uh, the reduction in carbon, which are transition assets and aligning it up with the science. Um, so, so you, you know, a transition asset today is actually a stranded asset tomorrow. So making sure that that's quite clear. Uh, and, and in Australia, we're also, you know, looking to do that between the banks and, and um, uh, insurers and, 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 and investors, trying to also look at bringing some sort of consistency in approach around, you know, how, how do you actually think about whether something is a positive impact uh, or not. Um, so that is trying to, to address some of those uh, issues around um, rainbow or green uh, washing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's fair to say, even if you look at 
climate, which is a lot more mature and it's got a lot more sort of science behind it, uh, that's probably the one which you have sort of a, a higher chance of getting sort of consistency there. But yeah. Um, yeah. as has been mentioned, when you start looking at that, um, you know, you know, it starts to give you some clues or indicators as to how you might want to approach the same problem in other spaces. I mean, maybe, Karen, if I could just add that, that, that I think part of this is, is that if you talk to most investors, they're very happy with the concept of ESG um, and their, their beliefs. And I think perhaps what we're, what we're fundamentally addressing is moving that mindset to the SDGs over time. And there's a lot of things that need to happen, training and education, development of metrics, et cetera, et cetera. But, it, but, but I sense that is the direction we ought to be heading. Quite, quite how quickly we're going to get there and how difficult a journey it is, is uh, very difficult yeah. to say. And we'd recommend the SDGG recommendations to help organisations get there, mm. wouldn't we? We most certainly yeah. would, yes. Um, Richard. Do you have any thoughts on um, future directions from research, for research coming from this discussion? I do, I do, and it's been very fruitful. So I've noted just a, a number of a number of areas. Um, I think the first one is that in, in the past we've tended to focus as researchers quite a lot on annual reports, um, or maybe standalone um, sustainability reports. But I think it's high time that we were a bit more adventurous and uh, explored alternative uh, media for SDG uh, reporting. Um, as many of the panellists have, have alluded to, um, they go well beyond just the annual report for their information. So I think there could be some very exciting research in that field. That may be developed into um, the use of big data um, and artificial intelligence, how that is used um, within SDG uh, reporting, but also in uh, looking at SDG analysis. A, a, a third area where I think in the past there has been a, a far more limited literature is around uh, debt financing um, and um, SDG or ESG type issues. In the literature to date, there's been a larger focus more on um, the needs of the equity market mm -hmm. compared to the needs of the debt market. So I think there's um, some very exciting research that could be done in that area. Um, two, two final areas, um, one linking back to, to what Subash said in, in his uh, presentation around the development and the conceptual development of materiality matrix or uh, scenario analysis, as investors begin to grapple more fully with SDG uh, risks uh, beyond just an ESG framing. Um, and finally, just reflecting on a comment that, that Russell made around the role of, of governance and, and where does SDG fit? Uh, where are the risks reported in traditional reporting media? Uh, do they feature in the chief exec review? Do they feature in the chairman's report? Um, who takes responsibility um, for these risks? And how does that link into the, the tone at the top? Again, something that Subash referred to. Um, to, to gather the centrality of, of SDG. So I think there's a great deal of exciting research that, that can be done. And, and, and all of that was reflected in the, in, in the panelists' comments um, to, to help us become uh, a little bit more daring, perhaps, in the research and to, um, to start looking at some wider reporting media um, that would be both a little bit daring, but also um, very, very um, exciting to do. Yeah. And I think also talking to people more, uh, more case study and interview work to find out, you know, what it is people, in, investors and, and lenders are um, looking at and what the information gaps are. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about corporate reporting being what um, investors need, and it's important, but some of the information is obviously coming from other, other sources, um, 
whilst the corporate reporting is is yet to is yet to develop. Completely agree. So thank you all very much. That's been um, that's been a good uh, discussion. I've tried to type answers to a couple of the um, Q and A um, questions there. I don't know whether any of the panelists had any um, any comments on any of those questions that they they want to make before we close off. No. I've got one. Right. Well, Carol, I've got one. Yes. One final comment, which is, um, as these issues become increasingly important, they have to move from voluntary frameworks to being made mandatory. Absolutely. TCFD all, shows that in 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 very clearly. Well, all the research points to that too. There has been research over decades now showing that voluntary reporting. Um, uh, really doesn't work, that companies will um, present themselves in a favourable light, they'll leave out major um, issues and impacts that um, will come round, uh, impacts on their stakeholders and, you know, impacts on the environment that will come round to affect um, the, the enterprise value uh, and they'll miss them out of reports where it's not mandatory and it's not externally assured. So um, I think we would all here agree, agree with that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. Thank you.